WCW Monday Nitro number 239, April 17th of the year 2000. God damn. We Jesus. open with one of the very worst pay-per-view video recap packages I've ever oh, seen in my life. It was horrific. I will do my best to Why explain. Why bother? <laughs> to, to explain to you, the listener, Dude. what I was able to discern from this random collection, th th this, th this mon not montage, collage. Let me tell you what I got. All right, you go because first. Because I guarantee that you got more than I did. Okay, you go first. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nine million things happened. Okay. I think we're clear on that. Check. Jeff Jarrett won the world title. Yes. Tammy Sitch appeared. Mm -hmm. Scott Steiner won the U.S. title. Right? Am I, I, I wrong about maybe, that one? I don't know. It came out as U.S. champion. See, you, the you, show. Got that, you got that and okay. I did not. And somebody won the tag team titles. Uh, that I got. Other than that, I have no idea what happened. I guess it was was it Spring Stampede? Is that where they played this weird rodeo music? Yeah, the, the, some well, some horrible WWE Network edit Jesus. music. Again. Was, I'm not sure it was Vinny. Well, it was Spring Stampede. It is. Yeah. All right. Here's what I got out of this. Team Package beat the Mamelukes. Douglas and Bagwell beat Harlem Heat. You're already so far past where I was. Sting, I think, beat Booker T. Hogan and Kidman did something. Funk and Dustin and Norman did something. Steiner beat Awesome. Vampiro and Sting had a fight. Wait, Awesome was the U.S. champion? I think it was vacant. Oh, so that like, could be. Yeah. Uh, Vampiro and Sting had a fight. There was a six-man. Tammy debuted. Do we know who was in the six man? I believe Candido won. Oh, it was a six man it, for the cruiserweight title. It was a six person. A six way, yeah. Six way. Yeah. Uh he pinned Prince Ikea. I don't know who the four dudes are. Tammy debuted. Chronic debuted. Mm -hmm. Douglas and Buff are the tag champs now. Vampiro pulled Sting through the ring. Jarrett is world champ. And then I wrote, I'm sure I missed at least eight things. Oh, easily. Just a complete mess. A disaster. The show hasn't even started yet, and this is off the rails. Security is shown all around the building, making sure the doors are locked. Nobody can get in. Well, they announced it's invited guests only tonight. So I was like, why are there any baby faces on the show? What's the point? I don't know. Why did they let in the guy who ended up challenging for the title at the end of the show? I don't know. I don't know. The point is, we got, after that awful recap, we got... 30 seconds showing nothing but security promising no one can get into this building. I want you guys to remember, by the way, as we recap the show, that Vince Russo himself said, this is not an exact quote, but it's goddamn close. The, the, first, the first thing that we always think about when putting the show together is logic. Remember that? Remember that quote? When he talked about logic? I, I pay a little attention to what the Let, Let's says. go over the logic. No, this was at the time. Let's talk about the logic of this show. So we open with a a shaky crane shot. Like the whole building's about to collapse on the internet itself. There's confetti flying, there's balloons, there's flyers falling from the sky. Out comes Russo and Buff and Shane Douglas and Chris Candido and Tammy Sitch and Scott Steiner. So they drop thousands and thousands of balloons. Let me stop you for a moment. Mm -hmm. Also coming out are Riot Squad members. See, I didn't even notice that until the very end. Okay, so listen. I realize that the heels were the ones who were made fools of. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. All right. But is there a worse cliche than the Riot Squad guys that end up being the baby faces in disguise or the heels? Can anybody listen to this? I will PayPal you $10 US if anybody can find me a single incident in the history of professional wrestling that Riot Squad members have come out and they weren't somebody else in disguise okay i only want one it's not even wcw any national company it has to be a national company i don't think anything non-national could afford right squad gear anyway but if you can come up with one single time in the history of professional wrestling that the riot squad guys have come out in those outfits and it hasn't been somebody in disguise i will give you the first person ten dollars I remember for a long time on WWE CW, there were Riot Squad guys. And everyone knew it was the Bashams, but I forget if it was ever revealed. Well, we'll that, find out. It might be. It might be. I don't mean like, listen, if it's, if it's like a four-week storyline where the Riot Squad people come out for four weeks and on week four it ends up being somebody's, that doesn't count. I'm talking just like a one-time deal mm -hmm. where there were Riot Squad police out there and then they just went to the back yeah. and nobody was under the helmets. 
So the point is that I was going to make is they drop all these goddamn balloons and the fans say, hey, let's pop balloons. Oh, yeah. So for the rest of this, this promo, which had to go a half hour, you can't hear anything guys are saying because they're drowned out by the cannon fire, the cacophony of balloons being popped. It was, out the it place. was much longer than 30 minutes because <laughs> because they were out there for 30 minutes before they started talking. Yeah. They just played this victory music. These fucking balloons fell from the sky. They popped. Russo had to walk around celebrating. Yeah, there's a, the, uh, a term pop in wrestling. It's a euphemism for a crowd reaction. These were literal pops. Yeah. The balloons going pop, pop, pop. So Russo starts talking, of course. He's the real main eventer. The first thing he... Well, the first thing he does is talk about how they won all their titles, except the hardcore title, and he promises Terry Funk will lose that soon. Well, the first thing he says is, I'm better than all of you. That is the we very gotta, first thing we got to start said. there. Uh, uh, I didn't write it down. He's better than all of you, and you're all here because of your son, he said. So then he has to talk about the WWF. And of course. Guy in the black cowboy hat. JR, you can kiss my ass. He's so... Oh, obsessed with that place. It's really quite pathetic. He introduces Jarrett. At this point, I figured out that, or at least they explained to me, Kimberly turned on DDP at the pay-per-view. Yes. yes. we got to mention that when they mention the WWF, mm -hmm. they must bury Jim Ross. Yeah. They're very upset at Jim Ross. And Jarrett comes out, and he really buries Jim Ross. <laughs> I guess because... They released him Who knows? or whatever the story care. his contract i don't care well, this, is from, this is very important Vinny. all right how do you bury wwe and jim ross and the promotion and the announcer when they are massacring your ass destroying your ass i don't know crushing and ruining your ass they came off as very pathetic and wretched and and, and they, they were the people they, they were the guy who got dumped by the hot girl and never move on uh, in fact, Jarrett went, went so far as to say Jim Ross is in State College, Pennsylvania, which is where Jim Ross was for Monday Night Raw doing his job, which you guys were not doing because you're watching Raw. So Jarrett, the new world champion, issues a challenge to Diamond Dallas Page for the triple cage match, just like is in the main event of the brand new movie Ready to Rumble. Then Russo brings out Eric Bischoff and Kimberly. And Bischoff brags about screwing Paige and also brags about screwing Kimberly in a different way. Kimberly starts cutting this promo, and it's a bad promo, but I couldn't focus on it too much because was there any vacuum cleaner running in this building? <laughs> I don't know. What was the background hum? Well, maybe they were vacuuming up all of those balloons. I guess. That popped. I guess. Gotta get rid of those things. So she is upset about standing in Paige's shadow. She is the star, and she's looking out for herself now. So Bischoff takes the mic back, and he goes on a rant about how the building is locked down and they are all secure. As he is ranting, we cut backstage where Dallas Page conveniently drives up and he has to beat up security. Yeah. He storms into the building. He says, I'm going in. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. He beats up four men by himself. Yeah. They're all shitty security, I might add. Yeah. He passes Sean Seaziak and Kurt Hedick hanging out together in the entranceway. He goes down to the ringside area, and here everyone thinks the riot squad will stop him, but no, they let him go to the ring, then they help him, and hey, Brian, the riot squad were Ric Flair and Sting and Lex Luger in disguise. I can't believe it. And they all clear the ring, and they play Sting's music. Yeah. I don't think I succeeded in explaining to the viewers how long no, of course not. and boring no. and pointless this, this segment was. This was so long and fucking boring, and it was all about... You'll never guess, getting heat. <laughs> but you know what? As a fair man, as a fucking fair man here, and I am a fair man, they got heat on the pay-per-view. All of the heels won. They opened up with a segment that was all about heat. And then, for the rest of the show, the baby faces began to get their revenge. Including the end of the segment. That is a fucking whole lot more than I could say for Raw nowadays. Fair point. So after the break, Bischoff is backstage chewing out a bunch of guys. The future misfits in action and Bam Bam Bigelow's there and Jerry Flynn and Booker T. It's mic'd horribly. But they are all shamed and told to leave. And as they're walking out, Vince Russo physically shoulder checks Chavo Guerrero. Yeah. He's got to look like a tough guy. Oh, wait till later when he stands up to both of Chronic. Yeah, yeah that happened. It's true. So Russo goes to get Mike Awesome. Security walks in, quits. Oh, hold on a second. Four geeks walk in. I'm like, who are these fucking guys? 
What low carters are they that I forgot about? <laughs> Luckily, it wasn't my fault this time. It's security. Sure. They walk in and they say, Eric, you never told us we were going to get our ass beat by wrestlers tonight. We quit. I was like, wait a second. You are security at a wrestling show. Right. You didn't think that your job description might include getting in a brawl with fucking wrestlers? What the fuck did you think you were there for? Watch the show and eat concessions? You're fucking security at a goddamn wrestling just, show. Just hang out with the riot squad. No yeah. shit there might be a brawl involving wrestlers. You fucking idiots. They quit. Yeah. Which, by the way, what I got out of this was Eric found four chumps at a bar or something and paid him to work security at his vent. I, I guess. What a fucking cheapskate. Yeah. When you hire real security. So then, they leave. Eric stares at a phone. Yes. And he there's a phone on his desk and he stares and he stares and he stares and the phone doesn't ring. No. There's it's there. Like the, the phone doesn't ring, but he picks it up. And then we can hear Hulk Hogan's voice. Yeah. And he's threatening Eric and says he's going to beat him up in 5 minutes. Okay, so I'll I'll defend this partly, okay? If somebody calls this phone, it won't ring. But I'll see a little light that goes on right there. Maybe that's the kind of phone he had. But if I pick up that phone, it's not a speaker phone. No. One way or the other, this was bullshit. It, it took me a minute. There was a lack of logic like, <laughs> in this segment here. They faded to black and then really sunk in what happened. We did not hear the phone ring. Yes. But we did hear the voice at the other end of it. Yeah. These idiots. So remember when I said Sean Stasiak and Kurt Hennig were hanging out together as Paige stormed by them? Yes. Sean Stasiak versus Kurt Hennig. Yeah. Before the match even starts, Miss Hancock comes out to watch with, as they said, called it, her writing tablet. <laughs> writing tablet. She's laying out the Ten Commandments, I Vince guess. Vince doesn't like the word clipboard. <laughs> Vince Russo. Scott Hudson explains she is not taking notes to call into the sheets. So they have this... I love that they took a guy off the Observer hotline, and he's the guy that has to rant about the sheets. It's actually hilarious. So... Imagine... I'll, I'll take over, Vinny. All right. Sean Stasiak is the perfect one. Yeah. <laughs> Facing the former Mr. Perfect. Right. Okay. So, I'll just give everyone a, a quick update on... A hundred things that every WWE fan should know or do before they die. Yeah, a book, I believe. Yes, coming out in July. Oh, okay. yeah. I had, I had four, I believe, left to write when I was in Hawaii. So I turned in all, I turned in ninety six or something like that, and I said I'll leave four. So if we think of anything at the last second, we can do the four extra ones. Okay. So I had to come up with four extra ones to do. And I thought, you know what, I'm gonna have R. D. Reynolds write one on the worst gimmicks in WWE history. So he wrote one. And so then I thought, you know what? If I were lazy, which I'm not, I would write the best gimmicks in WWE history, and the whole entry would just write The Undertaker. Mm. That's the whole thing. I didn't do that, but I thought about it. Point of this is, The Undertaker is the greatest gimmick in WWE history. Sure. It's a gimmick that should not fucking ever have lasted more than a year fair it should have been repo man it should have been skinner it should have been any of those papa, shitty, papa shango yeah papa shango basically was the undertaker pretty close he was a guy that did magic yeah right mm -hmm. but the undertaker was ended up being a gimmick that was like one of the biggest stars in the history of this entire business ever in any company for decades okay sure yeah one point there was also a fake undertaker right fucking sucked it did okay if anyone else would have played the undertaker this would have been repo man there's only one man that could play the undertaker and have made it such a success i believe mm -hmm. it's mark calloway yeah. Can you imagine rick flair being the fucking undertaker no good or sean michaels kidman hey kid you with the mullet you're a dead guy now wouldn't have worked yeah. you know what i'm saying well we learned during this match that not anybody could just be Mr. Perfect. You don't say. Sean fucking You were a five-minute rant to say that? Yes, because I don't want to bury Sean Stasiak by just pointing out that there's no gimmick he could have played. 
which is actually what I thought when this was over. I'm trying to be kind of nice about it. Or it's just like he was given a hard, you know, it was a rough road to He home. did have big shoes to fill. He had big shoes to fill. And boy, did he not fill them. Jesus, God. And this they, match sucked. And then they okay? put him in there with the original Mr. Perfect. Yes. And I'm like, even as Kurt Hennig, he is 5,000 times more perfect than the perfect one here. So it's like they're wrestling underwater. Because <laughs> there's... Doing this half speed and it's terrible. Two minutes in a ref bump. There's a ref bump. And Stasiak. Uh, the, the ref goes down. Hennig hits the fisherman suplex, but there's no ref. Why is there no ref? Because one of the announcers says, Charles Robinson caught that glancing blow. <laughs> yeah. It might have got him right in the eyeball. So this is a terrible show, Brian. It's horrible. So All right, I'm gonna get angry. And the perfect one hits Hennig with Nux, mm -hmm. knocking him out. Yeah. He can't just pin him after hitting him with Nux. He's gotta hit his move. Yes. Like Mr. like Triple H. Yeah, well, we'll get to him. His oh, move, we'll get to him. Oh, we will. His move is an F five. Yes. In two thousand. I never realized how hard the F five was. <laughs> So we've learned today that Sean Stasiak is not as good as Kurt Hennig or as good as Brock Lesnar. No, neither no, of them. No. He fucked this up. He fell on his own face. This is the movie he was trying to do last week where he fell on his ass. Yeah. Maybe just like, you know, just cover the guy. Maybe just do a sleeper. <laughs> so then Stasiak starts stomping on the guy and they go to the back mm -hmm. in the middle of stomping yeah. because Hulk Hogan has arrived. Hulk Hogan shows up dressed like Suburban Commando. He gets out and confronts the cops, tells them to move. They say no. He says move. They say okay. <laughs> but to be fair, <laughs> I know you're getting angry. I am. What happened was the cops say, you're not allowed in. And Hulk Hogan stands there and he says, I'm going in. The cop says, you're not going in. And so Hulk Hogan says, Are you waiting for me to say something? No, he just stares at him. I see. For, like, an uncomfortable amount of time. But not long enough, actually. Because after staring at them for this uncomfortable amount of time, the cop finally goes, let him in. <laughs> he used a Jedi mind trick. <laughs> he did. To get into this goddamn building. He is Obi-Wan Hogan. So, Hoagie Wan Kenobi. <laughs> Hoagie Wan Kenobi. <laughs> this fucking show. <laughs> so... Hogan he then, fucking used magic to get in. Hogan then storms into the building, going the exact same path with the exact same camera angle that Dallas Page used five minutes prior. Yes. I'm watching the exact... It's like the show is a rerun of itself. Yes. I had deja vu. Hogan gets to the entranceway, like the curtain right before where he walks out, and he stops, and he throws in the brakes, and he looks back like behind the camera, and so someone's telling him, Yo, Hulkster, you can't go that way. Go around. So they... Cut to a crowd shot. Hogan goes around the stage and then goes down the ramp. What's he do when he gets out of the ring? He beats the shit out of the perfect one. Yeah, he's still there. So he just got to win over like Kurt Hennig. Ten minutes has been stomping Kurt Hennig, and he Hogan beat his ass like a fucking geek. Mm -hmm. Left him laying, and he helps Hennig to his feet. So we go to the break and we come back, and Hogan is cutting a promo. May I recap his promo? I've had it. He says, "I've listened to the fans and critics alike." Yes, I'm getting older. So is everybody else in that damn locker room. Day by day. I haven't lost a step. I've only lost a half step. I still have something to offer the wrestling business. I'm here to lead by example. As far as my spot in this business goes, being a lead dog, if there's anybody in the back who wants to come take my spot, I'm ready to kick their ass. He says, you can mess with the character of Hulk Hogan. I can slip on a banana peel for the one, two, three. But when Eric and Russo pull what they did at Nitro in the pay-per-view. They're messing with the man, Terry Bollea. You're taking food out of my children's mouths, money out of my pocket. You messed with the right... He was worth 30 million, by the way. You messed with the wrong guy because I have more heart than both of, the, both of those guys put together. If someone wants to take my spot, they better be man enough to come out here and beat my ass and take it. And fuck you, Kidman. I'm sick of you. If you want my spot, get your ass out here and try and take it. You'll never guess what happened. Fucking place goes crazy for Hulk Hogan. He's the biggest baby face on the entire show. The biggest star by far. That all happened. And it, then it, it, it was it was funny because I was watching this and it, it's not like it's a bad promo, but it's not a, it is not a classic Hulk Hogan promo. No, but it was a goddamn good promo. He never said brother, he never said Jack, he never said dude, he never no. talked about pythons, and I thought to myself, you know what? He's being Terry Balea. Yes. And then he says, I'm Terry Balea. 
Yes. All right. So Kidman appears on the screen. He's being Billy Kidman. Oh, boy, was he. He's not being Pete Gruner. <laughs> Pete Gruner would be much cooler. He calls, He says, Hogan, I'm going to come back there. You can come back here. So Hogan starts storming to the back, and Kidman, they're in a parking garage. Kidman is standing there with Tori Wilson. Eric Bischoff is in the background. Kidman just is around to the concrete floor and the walls and the pillars and says, look at this place. This place is great. I don't know why it was so great. Why? <laughs> He's somewhere. <laughs> great. It's a parking lot. Somewhere is better than nowhere, Vinny. <laughs> it really is. It really is. So we go to break. We come back. We get one of the few shining lights of pleasure on the show. Hulk Hogan throwing a tantrum. You son of a bitch! Kidman! God damn it, Kidman! Kidman! You son of a bitch, I'll kick your ass! Kidman, you son of a bitch! It never gets old to me. No, I can watch, hilarious. I can watch Hogan throw a tantrum for hours, which is a good thing, because he did. Gene interviews Jeff Jarrett. Jeff Jarrett issues an open challenge to anyone in the new blood. No millionaires, he says. Oh. We get the wall versus Terry Funk. Sad to know the man who accepted that challenge is not a millionaire after all these years in this business. <laughs> it's actually really amazing. Yeah. It just speaks poorly about his financial plannings. So, two notes about the wall. One, he finally, finally ditched the shirt and tie. Just has a like That's a right. black Under Armour shirt. Two, didn't care enough. He has, on. they call it Nitro Vision, the big screen where they play the entrance videos. Yes, horrible. They put the infamous, the notorious shot of the wall on top of the hotel in his entrance video. <laughs> he should have. That's what he's most famous for. It will for, be Vinny. one of his legacy, being on top of that damn hotel. So we get more clips from Spring Stampede of Terry Funk yelling at Dustin Rhodes, and then we are told that Dustin has been fired. Okay. So it's a Terry Funk hardcore match in the year 2000. There's oh my a, god. Funk beat his ass. There's a bunch of chair shots. Chair shots to the head. Chair shots to the back. Moonsault to the floor. Goes for the moonsault. The wall isn't there. He lands on his fucking head. He sure did. Sold like he was dead, which he practically was. Mm -hmm. Still fought to his feet. Pile driver on the announce desk, which does not break. Mark Mann said Funk was born on leap year, so he was really 224 years old. <laughs> does he know how leap year works? That, I didn't catch that. That's actually a funny line. But it's not true. I know it's not true. He would be, what, 12? Well, it, it, what he's saying 15. is when they, when they list Funk's birthday as 50-whatever, they're only counting every fourth year. I see. So you're doing it the other way. I see. Yes. So Funk and the Wall brawl up by the stage and begin to fight by a go-go dancer's cage. Yeah, why was there a go-go dancer's what? cage there? <laughs> why is there a go-go dancer's cage by the entrance we had Nitro? What's going on No one on ever here? used this at any point during the show. Maybe they were getting ready for impact. And there were hot women all over the place. Remember when they had those women dancing Lollipop in Lollipop was in one. Yeah. So Vince Russo personally carted around a shark he, cage he for might, years he hoping might, a go-go dancer would cross his path. He may have checked it. That's actually totally believable. Thank you. Funk won with a foot. Oh, God! They're brawling backstage. They're brawling backstage, and as they're fighting, I still don't know what happened. Tables rain from the sky. Well, yes. First off... It's like when they had the, like, the nets holding the balloons over the building everywhere. There were also tables in there. They didn't fall for a half hour. I could be wrong here, but as they're brawling, first Funk gets his head slammed in the go-go cage. He starts screaming, You son of a bitch! And he's throwing <laughs> he gets, windmills. He gets bleeped repeatedly. <laughs> I could be wrong, okay? But I am I am ninety five percent certain that he called the wall a chicken fucker. <laughs> I'm, I'm almost positive. I I know the moment you're thinking of. And the, I'm virtually positive. The cadence certainly fits. Yes, and yes, wall was standing there, and goddamn fucking motherfucking tables fell from heaven, cloudy with a chance of tables, and landed on the goddamn wall, and then Funk pinned him. Yeah. What? I don't know. I don't know. And by the way, let me let me explain that one more time. Tables fell from the fucking sky and landed on the wall. Funk pins him, and it's to the back yeah. immediately. Yeah. There's no follow up to tables falling from the fucking sky. No, there wasn't on this show. <laughs> if you hadn't written it down, I wouldn't have remembered. And I just watched this five minutes. You ago. forgot about the tables falling from the sky. I forgot about everything on this goddamn show. Chronic wants a title match. They want Vince Russo to grant them a title match because they lived up to their end of the deal. Russo says this is not a good night. 
They will get their title shot when he says so. And Chronic, which for those of you who don't know, is a six foot six three hundred pound Brian Adams, best known as Crush, and the other six foot six three hundred pound Brian Clark, best known as Wrath. A couple of big, scary, jacked up monsters. And Russo looks them in the eye, says, "You'll get a title shot when I'm good and ready." And he walks through them and out the door. Yeah, because they're afraid of Vince Russo. Because he's a tough guy. How do you not get angry at the show? Oh, I'm getting angry. All right, here we go. Here's one. Here's one to make you angry. We get a close-up contract, a shot of the contract hanging on Jeff Jarrett's door. Jeff Jarrett, locker room door, open contract, bunch of paperwork in a blank spot. And the announcers are talking about it, and suddenly we see a hand with a red Sharpie. And they see the Sharpie begin to sign the contract. And they say, who is it? Who signs? And we fade to black. Now, there's a camera guy right there. And I know this because I'm looking through his camera at what he's shooting. So I figure, okay, we'll go to break. We'll come back. And the cameraman will, all he has to do is, all he has to do is zoom out. No. The cameraman, again, cameraman did not know who signed this contract. Jeff Jarrett walks up, sees the contract. He's very angry. He calls Vince Russo an idiot. He's not wrong. You know, the cameraman could have panned up when those fucking tables fell from the sky, too. That would have helped as well. Didn't think about doing that either. Would have helped as well. Dallas Page is cutting a promo. He's wearing a Sopranos t-shirt. I forgot the Sopranos actually started in the year 2000. He's cu- he's wearing a Sopranos t-shirt as the Mama Luke's music is playing. Yeah. That was amazing. He's got a match with Mike Awesome later, and Gene goes, what do you think about your match with Mike Awesome later? And DDP goes, whatever. Then he cuts a promo about it. <laughs> I'm pissed off about last night. This Kimberly Bischoff thing isn't over by a long shot. I'm going to kick Awesome's ass. I'm going to leave him laying, and I'm going to tear him a new ass. Yeah. That doesn't sound like whatever. Yeah. Gene was aghast. He wants to, he says. Tearing a new ass. He says he hopes he gets a chance to put Eric in the hospital before Hulk does. So the Mama Lukes, as noted, we could hear their music. They are in the ring for a match, but we cut backstage where Chronic is destroying the heresies. So, Chronic then goes... They were supposed to be the opponents. They're supposed to be the Harrises versus the Mamelukes for the number one contender spot. But Chronic takes out the the Harrises and they go out and they take out the Mamelukes. So, they're just destroying them and no selling everything and laying them out. And what should happen? But for the second time in an hour, a guy hits an F5. Yeah. (laughs) Brian Adams, he did much better than Sean Stasiak. Uh, Clark hits the meltdown. There's double choke slams for everyone. They were total monsters and killers here. Crowd was totally into it. And Adams cuts a promo. It was much better than the promo he cut on Superstars and made fun of our last show. That is the lowest fucking praise I've ever heard. <laughs> this promo was fucking terrible. And all I thought was, was Wrath that bad a promo? That they were like, Brian Adams, you handle this I'm one. trying to think if I've ever heard Wrath or Adam Bomb ever cut a promo. I'm not sure I have either, but he, he it's inconceivable. Or the, or the Night Stalker. He could be worse. <laughs> so, anyway, he tells Russo, you don't want us... To- working against you he says chronic a lot and by the end of this they had music and that was it it's one of my favorite things on the show it's it's ever since russo came back this is one of this is one of the things every time that russo is running a program i laugh about so music plays and the announcers are baffled they can't figure out what's going on so they cut to a shot of the announcers as they're baffled and sitting in front of them is a stack of papers a mile high (laughs) It's like fucking this high. <laughs> and I'm like, God damn, I don't know whose music is playing. I'm like, what's on those fucking papers? I'm like, what's on those papers in real life? You know what I'm saying? I was suspect the actual script for every single one of these promos was like word for word. No, I mean, if we're imagining this is a sport and it's real, what's on all these goddamn papers? I don't know. I don't think we're supposed to believe it's real. <laughs> well, anyway, it's Vampiro. Vampiro's in the ring. Now, this is this this was this was weird to me. He says I got a message from my brother in pain. I was like, pain? I thought it was paint. Was it paint? That was their tag team name, yes. Well, now they're the brothers in pain. Yeah. Because he's specifically bringing up how Sting knows something about pain. Which begs the question, how can you be a brother in pain if you know nothing about pain? That's a goddamn good question. So Logic. He, he runs down Sting. He promises to devour him in three weeks of Slamboree. Fans are booing and calling him a loser and chanting boring. Sting's entrance plays. Lights go out. The song plays. Vampiro is looking around in the spotlight in the ring. He's... 11 months. To the end of the show. and then After the death of Owen Hart. Well, yes. Yeah. Sting drops from the ceiling 
at 90 miles an hour. He does hit the ring. I shouldn't say hit the ring, but he, yes, they, 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 they put the brakes on. But he I guess descended very rapidly. He landed so hard, I have no idea how he didn't break both of his legs. This is the first time he repelled since the yeah. death of Owen Hart. Well, I don't even want to get off on this. So it's bullshit, Vinny. It's bullshit. That's what it is. It is total bullshit. So Sting drops in, but at least he does have a harness, a functioning harness that Owen Hart lacked. So now he has to unhook it. So Vampiro, meanwhile, in the 15 seconds it takes Sting to unlash himself, poor Vampiro just has to stand there and act scared. Like the biggest geek you ever saw. He can't throw a kick. He can't throw a punch. He can't strike a pose. He has to, like, put his hands on his face and turn around and look at the crowd and crouch and cower and hide forever. So I can already hear the Russo creeps going, God, Brian and Vinny, they complain. They complain that... that there wasn't enough safety with Owen Hart, but then when they actually do have safety for the guy, they complain that it takes him forever to get out of the harness. Yes. Don't have him come down from the goddamn ceiling. Don't drop him. Have him come down come from the back or from the crowd or I anything just, under the fucking ring. He doesn't have to come from the goddamn ceiling. There were like 20 guys, sneak attacks in the show that did not involve a guy doing a harness. No, he doesn't sure need to come from the one. fucking ceiling. There's so, no, not, Him coming from the ceiling didn't do one goddamn thing for their business. No. So eventually Sting gets unhooked. And he looks at Vampiro. Now I'm mad. And Vampiro looks at him, and Sting just beats his ass. Could they have done anything more to make Vampiro look like a geek here? No, he beat the shit Sting out of him. Sting beats him and beats him and stops to talk. He He's talking now. He's hit him with a bat and kicked him and stomped him a few times. And Sting has the mic. He's cutting a promo. Vampiro is on his knees, cowering, going, no. Sting is beating him and beating him and beating him. He hits his finish, and he leaves. Yeah. Get his heat back. <laughs> I guess. He got sucked to hell last night. Hogan is still looking for Kidman. He's storming back. It's been an hour. It's been an hour. He's still throwing a tantrum. He's still angry and furious. But as you recall, Hogan has two things to say to Kidman, which are goddamn Kidman and Kidman, you son of a bitch. Hogan storms into this hallway. And what is before Hulk Hogan but a table of youngsters? And I know he said he's Terry Balea. But this is still the Hulkster. And he catches himself. And he just shouts as angrily as he can. You can't see Kidman! And he storms off. Caught himself. He's like a, a prof professional. He is a professional. Jeff Jarrett bitches to Russo. We still don't know who the challenger is. DDP versus Mike Awesome. Russo says, I got you into this. I'm going to go get you out of it. I'll go talk to the guy. So Mike Awesome now in his first match on Nitro. Look great. Great shape. Hair looked great. Does got all his big moves in. The 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 the, the uh, springboard planche of the floor. Looked awesome. Highlight of this match is Diamond Dallas Page is getting a chair and Mark Madden launches into a rant. Tirade. And what did you have to say, Brian? WCW says they're relaxing the rules. Relaxing the rules. They're gonna let the guys fight like it should be. Hmm. Now do you remember what he said about the fans about this? The fans? The, the viewers at home. He, he informed us all, nobody tunes in to see a DQ. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That was, nobody Logic. tunes in to see a DQ. At this exact point, Chris Canyon hits the ring and attacks Mike Awesome for the DQ. Well, you're close, Vinny. I was, I was fixing to write that, but that's actually not exactly what happened. Canyon hits the ring and it's not a DQ. Mike Awesome kills him with a German suplex in the middle of the ring, okay? Let me repeat that. Canyon runs in, and it's not a disqualification. No. Mike Awesome, well, then, Mike awesome then goes outside, and he lifts up the apron, and he reaches under the ring, and he pulls a table halfway out from under the ring. Ref calls for the bell. He, he, producer Ken is so shocked he just punched his mic. That was a disqualification. Now. That he began pulling a table from underneath. He didn't use the table. He didn't even set the goddamn table up. He didn't even bring the table into the ring. He was grabbing the table when they called for the bell. Okay, I must argue a fine point with you. As soon as Kenyon hit the ring, the referee began to call for the bell. But the bell ringer didn't see it? The, I guess. I see. The bell did not ring. You were correct there. The bell didn't ring until 
awesome one for the table. Well, but, if we're going to debate the fine points, mm-hmm. then the bell rang one ding, but then stopped. Okay. And then it was a pause, and then the ref kept going like this, and it ding, 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 ding. So we're anyway, now, maybe this is a Morse code message we have to decode. Classic WCW here. The first of many DQs after we're told there will not be DQs. Fans don't tune in to see DQs. Fans do not tune in to see DQs. No. So Awesome hits this German suplex. He sets up a table. He's going to powerbomb through it, but he's interrupted by Kevin Nash's music. Excuse me, Kevin Nash? Kevin Nash's music plays. Now, you recall one segment earlier, Vampiro was interrupted by Sting's music, and he got jumped from behind by the babyface. Mike Awesome is distracted by Kevin Nash's music, and he's jumped from behind by the babyface. That happened. Because the seven-foot Kevin Nash who has undergone dozens of knee surgeries, tiptoes through the crowd, and sneaks up on Mike Awesome like a ninja, and lays him out, and powerbombs him through this table, and Nash, and Paige, and Canyon, who I guess is a millionaire now, uh, they all celebrate. Well, let's talk about the fact that Mike Awesome debuted last week. He did. This week, he has already been put through a table like a fucking geek Mm -hmm. by a guy who's actually gigantic. Yeah. So now, he doesn't look anywhere near as impressive as he did last week. Or when he was beating up Spike Dudley, who was a small guy. He is significantly uh, worse off now than he was before he got to the company. Yep, that's true. He was a, he was a bigger star before he got there. Russo is shown trying to talk the mystery man out of taking this title shot. Now, I hated the show. This show made me angry. This show made me furious. But. Oh, God, not this. One of the very last episodes of Monday Night Raw I watched all the way through before I just threw in the towel. Michael Cole was on commentary when Brock Lesnar made his big return. And the last time we saw Brock, he was tearing Cole's arms off. And Matt Cole just screams, oh my. And I ranted. And I went out and That's right. Me. When Tank Abbott comes out here a week after beating and humiliating Mark Madden before the whole world, Mark Madden pisses himself. He panics. He cries out for help. This show, WCW Monday Nitro on its deathbed. It's on life support at this point. Yeah. Better, more logical, more internal logic than modern era Monday Night Raw. Vinny, I realize that you've beaten diabetes, okay? Mm-hmm. But let me tell you something. Yeah. If you hadn't quit, wa- uh, quit Raw when you did, yeah. you would be dead right now. Or likely, yeah. That is how bad. If that... <laughs> If that right there yeah. was enough to make you quit Raw because of the lack of logic, yeah. you would, there's no way if I made you watch every single one of these Raws from that moment till today that you would still be alive. The, it's impossible. I believe you. Thank you. I believe you. Buff Bagwell and Shane Douglas are cutting a promo on Team Package. So the tag team champions here, they address their top challengers to the tag team titles and challenge them to a pair of single matches at Slamboree. What? Why? I don't know. Uh. Well, except, except that Shane Douglas has been wanting a single match with Flair for 20 years, as we've been told here. Yeah, worry about that when you don't have the tag titles. Speaking of which, did you notice how ghetto these tag team belts are? Well, Were these replica toys? They could have been. So, Douglas wants Flair the pay-per-view. He wants Lex He wants Luger. that stinky ass Ric Flair. He didn't want that stinky ass. He had to make ass. sure that he had a lot of profanity in there, yeah. as much as he could get in. He wants Lex Luger tonight. Lex Luger is there to accept, but he has a stipulation in mind. He will face Shane Douglas in a singles match tonight, but if Vince Russo interferes before the final bell, then Lex Luger and Ric Flair will be awarded the tag team championships. Dumb baby face. Should have said anybody. Well, not just that. And, and, and Yes, but a tag team title chains via DQ in a singles match? That sucks. <laughs> Vinny, just wait. <laughs> just just because Wait. something else sucks more later in the future, Brian, does not mean this does not suck now. Uh, did I say it was any fucking good? No, you're not. I'm just warning you so you don't have a heart attack this next year we're watching. Tank Abbott comes out for a promo. He still wants Goldberg. He says he's going to beat up innocent idiots who think Goldberg is a hero. So earlier in the show, we were introduced to the Chicago Blackhawks owner, who must have been in tight with somebody in WCW. Flair. He- I'm going to ask a silly question. They were, because, yes, they were this friends is for decades. The same guy, they signed the contract with him and Lex in 87, uh, 88 on this guy's yacht. He's there with one of his hockey players, Bob Probert, a known hockey fighter. So Goldberg goes after the Blackhawks owner. Now, Tank. <laughs> excuse me, Tank. Tank goes after the Blackhawks owner. And it's important because Goldberg is a trained wrestler. Tank basically had no idea what he was doing. So Tank goes to yank this, I don't know how old the guy was, 60-year-old man, we'll say. Basically, he pulls him over the barricade, he grabs him for a pile driver, 
and carries him over to the ring like that and then slams him into the apron. I thought he was going to drop him on his head. I thought he was going to drop him on his face. I was terrified by what might happen here. He throws him into the ring. Bob Probert, the enforcer, jumps in to make the save. There's a bunch of referees to pull him apart, and there you go. God, he carries him in pile driver position. Just rams him gut first in the fucking hardest part of the ring. You've been better off fighting the hockey player. Oh, floor. my God. How did Bruce MacArthur go along with this? He could have been killed. <laughs> he cannot possibly have known what he was really getting into. Uh, no. Hulk Hogan is still looking for Billy Kidman. Jarrett and Russo are still pitching at each other. Lex Luger versus Shane Douglas for the third match in a row. Somebody's music plays and somebody's distracted. Out comes Buff Bagwell and he grabs Lex and Shane hits Lex in the nuts for the DQ that fans do not tune in to see. They brawl outside. There is a Sting fan. He has a thick black coat on and a big black wig and a Sting mask. And they say, hey, on Thunder, it was Vince Russo under that mask. Who is it tonight? And they brawl over by this guy and the Sting fan hits Shane with a bat and he pulls off his mask. It's Ric Flair. Amazing. What an amazing coincidence. And they start having this fight. Russo comes out and saves Douglas. And as Russo and Douglas are shouting at each other, the announcers say, there's heat there. There's heat. Hogan finds the white Hummer in the parking garage. This fucking two-hour storyline is coming to a close. As he walks towards the Hummer, we go to break. Perfect timing. We come back. Hulk Hogan is beating up Kidman. Tori Wilson hits Hogan with a board in the back. Hogan responds by grabbing her by the throat, pushing her into a pillar so she can't escape, and rearing back to punch her, and in all likelihood, kill her. Billy Kidman makes the save. He saves the damsel in distress. They're doing this fight. Suddenly, we cut to a shot to Eric Bischoff in the distance. We're looking over his shoulder. The camera is behind him. We see the back of Bischoff's head and a tiny little Hogan and Kidman fighting way over yonder. So Hogan throws Kidman, presses him overhead into a dumpster. He starts to stalk Eric Bischoff. Bischoff jumps into the Hummer. It won't start. Bischoff runs away. Hulk jumps into the Hummer. It starts right up for Hulk. Even man is like, oh, of course it starts now. Hogan drives the Hummer into the dumpster repeatedly. Mark Madden says, quote, Billy Kidman could be dead. And Hogan drives off after Bischoff. Man, I can't find a goddamn thing about Bruce MacArthur to find out how old he was. That's all I cared about for all of this. Hmm. And I was over this. I'll kill you, says Hogan. Well, he... Man of his word. He tried. He tried. He beat his ass hither and yon, I wrote. Kidman is stretchered out of the dumpster. Yeah, the geeks are telling him to breathe. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks for the tip. Jeff Jarrett's mystery opponent is Scott Steiner. Get out to Steinerized. <laughs> he's a baby face this week, I In guess. In 2000. Yeah, can you imagine? So, no. <laughs> Literally, let's cut to the chase. Nothing happens, and Booker T runs in for the goddamn DQ. A DQ, you say? A DQ in so, the main event? Right after... I think it was whoever said the fans do not tune in for a DQ. We got three DQs in a row. Yes. Right after they said that. <laughs> I'll play your music soon, Vinny. Oh, we're almost done. Calm yourself the, the, down. The end is in sight. Hulk Hogan is still hunting for Eric Bischoff. Hogan apparently got Fuck out. Fuck you. He got out of I've the Hummer. I've been watching this for hours now. He got out of the Hummer. He got a bat. And now he's going to go beat his brains in. They show him running around with a bat backstage, and then, what better time to cut to a recap of the pay-per-view? <laughs> because they want to sell you the replay. God. Can you fucking imagine? I hadn't even thought of it that way. <laughs> That's what they were doing! And they cut back, Hogan finds Eric. Okay, Hogan goes into the locker room. There's one door. Hogan walks into the locker room, Bishop runs around a table, and out the door! Yes. Hell of a hunter, Hulk! You really, you really put the screws to him there. So they, they, they are supposed to be running to the ring, but Hogan, he did one jog at the beginning of the show. And from that point forward, he did nothing but walking. Now he's walking with a limp. This guy's shot. Gets in the ring. 
He starts beating up Eric in the corner, and who should come out? Well, first Russo comes out. The destroyer, Vince Russo. Who should follow him out but Brett the Hitman Hart? Now, your call, if you were unfortunate enough to remember last no, week's show. No, this is the point. Yeah. I don't recall. Okay. I have, I'm happy for you. I have no memory whatsoever okay. of the return of Bret Hart after his career-ending concussion. I am sincerely happy for you. <laughs> okay. Last week's show ended with Russo and Bischoff being all happy, and Bret came up behind them, and they all stared at each other. I know. I saw him standing on the ramp. But my point is, I don't remember any of this return of Bret Hart. It can't, it can't last more than like a week, right? It's I It's got to be the not. end of him. He comes out, he gets in the ring, and they decide to do a cliffhanger. The cliffhanger is Hogan has Bischoff in the corner. Hogan and Bischoff are both looking at Brett. The camera is looking between them at Brett, who is rearing back to hit somebody with a chair, and we fade to black. Well, he was looking at Hogan when he swung that chair. And the answer to the mystery, everybody, because you don't need to watch Nitro ever again, he hit Hulk Hogan. Okay. Why did Bret Hart come back and hit Hulk Hogan when he has suffered a career-ending head injury and is never going to wrestle again? Can Lo you explain any of this to me? Logic. Oh. An the answer, Brian, is logic. I, I forgot. Uh, miserable. The show was miserable. It was, it was Watching the show was misery. It was. I said that by repeating it. I'm going to play your music. I'm going to find out more information on this Bret Hart situation. Okay. Here we go. It took a lot of work. <laughs> the finishes on this show were pin after weapon shot, pin amidst mysterious fallen tables, no finish because there was a fight, not a match, a DQ that fans did not tune in to see, a second DQ that fans did not tune in to see, and in the main event, a third straight DQ that fans did not tune in to see. What an awful television that show. That show was shit, Brian. You terrible. were way too easy on it. I was way too easy on it. Wow. 